Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, distinguished guests. My name is Boaz Shamir, and I'm the Dean of Social Sciences at the Hebrew University. Uh, welcome to Mount Scopus and uh, to this event. Uh, the president of the Hebrew University, Menachem Megiddo, was going to address us. Uh, he's tied up in a meeting with uh, university presidents upstairs. He hopes to be able to join us later. About, uh, uh, about two years ago, we received a letter from Mr. Alan Doran uh, from the United Kingdom. And Mr. Doran <laughs> uh, told us in, in the letter that his father, who was already uh, more than 90 years of age, um, held a lecture by Professor Sergio de la Pergola from our university, who is also here. And uh, he found that lecture so uh, uh, inspiring and interesting that he decided he wants to donate a sum of money to the Hebrew University to establish a series of lectures on issues of population growth and development. Uh, we don't receive such letters very often, uh, but it is perhaps the ideal way of, of, uh, of uh, uh, making connections and getting support from, from people that some product of our work, be it a lecture or a book or a, a workshop or a study, arouses the interest of someone who says, I want to support this kind of work, I want to participate in it. Uh, it took us uh, about two years to realize uh, Mr. Doran's vision uh, because we wanted to, uh, to inaugurate this series of lectures with a really distinguished speaker. And luckily, uh, we found uh, this distinguished speaker in uh, Professor William Easterly from uh, NYU. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is the inaugural lecture of the uh, Benjamin David Doran Fund series of lectures on population growth and development. I'd like to thank, first of all, uh, the Doran family uh, for, for their interest in the Hebrew University and for uh, their generous gift. And I'd like to thank, of course, Professor Sergio de la Pergola, who caused this, uh, uh, who, who was the trigger or the originator of this event. And uh, to thank Dr. Guy Steklov, uh, who uh, took the main responsibility for handling uh, the contacts both with the Doran family and here at the university. He chaired the committee to choose the uh, speaker. Uh, he coordinated all the uh, uh, necessary arrangements. And he was assisted by uh, uh, Eitan Sheshitsky and uh, Moshe Chazan from the Economics Department, as well as by the Secretariat of the Economic Department. So I'd like to thank them all. And of course, I'd like to thank Professor Easterly for agreeing to come here and inaugurate this series of lectures uh, for us. So uh, I hope this will be, a, a, hopefully it will be an inspiring and interesting and important series. Uh, and I'd like to uh, pass the Master of Ceremony uh, role to Guy Steklov. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Boaz. Um, okay, so I'd like on behalf of the Doran Committee to uh, uh, to welcome you here to the first Doran Lecture. It's a great pr privilege uh, to be here today with the Dorans having come from the United Kingdom to be here with us and the Easterlies having come from the United States. And we hope this is going to be the beginning of a long and important uh, lecture series on population development and resources. It's a very important gift that they've given to us. To those of us working in the areas of population resources and development, this is a great opportunity to gain from ongoing scholarship in these areas across a range of different disciplines. We sit here at an institution of higher learning which produces good and sometimes exceptionally good scholarship. 
yet there's no arguing that we're pretty geographically remote from the main centers of academia and no matter how wide and how fast our broadband connection on the internet becomes and no matter how many electronic journals we can access at our you know sitting at our computers there's still something unique about a good lecture presenting an innovative idea or series of ideas and arguments unconventional research those are powerful and hard to beat and I hope these lectures are going to help to stimulate more research among us the academics and among students in our community I want to give special thanks to Avital Madison and Marcy Carlson Fishburne who helped with the organization but particularly I want to thank Netta Netta Zinger for putting together a fabulous job and really being helpful all the way through here now I'd like to introduce Alan Doran is going to say a few words Alan has been responsible for developing the idea in his father's name and after Alan Eitan Shishinsky is going to come and come and introduce our speaker thank you Professor Easterly ladies and gentlemen on this inaugural I'm grateful for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the genesis of this lecture series which is in the name of my father D.B. Doran in fact David Benjamin Doran rather than Benjamin David but as you'll hear names in our family are as in I think a number of Jewish families are a slightly fluid concept three elements came together for this lecture series they are our family Israel and the subject area first the family my father the patriarch who is now 94 years old was born in Poland as Boaz Kudnowski he chose not to be here and that's the measure of the man he tends not to do what's expected he does travel a little only a week ago he returned from a holiday his life has been shaped by rough experiences as a poor immigrant child in London and by unemployment greatly worsened by anti-semitism and when he was before he was 20 he was determined to be materially secure and independent he left school at 14 and collected qualifications pharmacy dentistry and medicine successively financing himself through work and through winning prizes he made his money through hard work being careful brave and lucky and because of my mother's support he's not a businessman by nature he's always read widely and as soon as he could he traveled widely his memory is fine he's still sharp interested and up-to-date across arts sciences and politics he's a tough character I had to work very hard to persuade him that the lecture series which was in fact my vision was something he should put his name to years ago he told me economics is poppycock not a serious subject overpopulation is another story so that's how I sold it to him he wants a transcript of the lecture by the way professor Easterly and this speech now Israel my father is viscerally attached to the Jewish people and through that to Zionism he's been here many times since coming in 1964 we have family here his dream was to invent something to help Israel he worked for years as a serious amateur chemist on slow release fertilizers for the Negev on desalination and on solar energy my interest in Israel began despite growing up in a town with no other Jews I read the novel Exodus when I was 10 years old rather early I wrote on Israel at my non-Jewish school and at 16 I desperately wanted to volunteer in the Six Day War my late mother told me that she had lived in Jaffa for two years as a teenager where her father had tried to set up a timber warehouse which was unfortunately burnt down by the Arabs and the insurance company didn't pay out so he retired hurt 
I came here on a student tour in the early 70s and became a passionate Zionist, which I remain. By my attachment to Israel, I feel connected more deeply to the what I see as the mighty sweep and drama of Jewish history and destiny. My dream as a student was to work from a base in Israel as a development economist, Tikkun Olam. At that time, Israel was still doing great work in many poor countries and had friends in the third world. I have, together with my family, deepened my attachment to Israel over the years. My wife's late and dearly loved father, Martin Savitt, was a leading figure in the British Jewish community and an equally strong Zionist. He first came here as a soldier on leave from Egypt in 1942, where he famously connected with a cousin he had never met but had heard of behind the counter of the Jerusalem post office. Although we're happy as a family living in Oxford, which is an excellent place for Jews, by the way, we're delighted with our little house in Naharia, which we've recently bought, where we, span, where we plan to spend about eight weeks in the year, Hezbollah permitting. Finally, the subject. I got interested in economics because of my dream. I did a master's in development economics and then went to work for E.F. Schumacher, author of Small is Beautiful. I hope you've all heard of him. He was a true prophet and a great economist. I've worked as an international economic consultant specializing in the finance and economics of the small business sector. However, like Schumacher and Herman Daly, another one of the greats, author of Beyond Growth, and unlike many academic economists, I see economics and markets as grossly imperfect man-made tools reflecting an unjust world and trying but often failing to serve the physical and spiritual needs of humanity and the planet. I now work partly on economic policy for Oxfam which is a leading international development NGO which again many of you may have heard of which is active in 70 countries the emphasis, the main emphasis, is on women and the children that they care for because they are the majority of the world's poor. Women's economic empowerment, about which Professor Easterly writes so vividly, is crucial in ensuring human survival. This lecture series was conceived as a very modest contribution to that end. Stretching the definition of divinely inspired teaching a little, Ki mitzion teisei Torah u'devar ad Hashem mi'Yerushalayim. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to have uh, Professor Menachem Megiddo, President of Hebrew University, come and say a few words. Thank you. Uh, uh, I was um, um, heard some of the remarks by uh, Dr. Doran um, before, and I was really moved by the uh, description of the attachment to Israel, attachment to the Jewish people and the, um, the need to, for um, a deep, academically serious discussion of uh, some of the issues uh, facing uh, the world today. Uh, I'm very, very happy to dedicate the uh, Duran Lectures uh, series um, today at the Hebrew University. And it has to do with exactly the, uh, uh, the issues of, uh, of Israel, uh, the Jewish people uh, in the world. Uh, Israel cannot survive by being mediocre. Israel needs to strive for the highest uh, academic standards. Uh, Israel should be a partner in the um, discussions of, uh, of the basic uh, problems facing, uh, uh, facing the world. We will not survive by being uh, uh, mediocre. And one of the dangers for us as an uh, academic community is the danger of uh, being entrenched within our own little pond uh, the danger of uh, uh, parochialism. Uh, so the connection to the world, the connection to the uh, having visitors uh, like Professor Easterly, uh, being exposed to what goes on, be partner in the discourse, the academic discourse that goes around the world, is essential for the academic vitality of um, of Israel, and it is essential for the uh, survival of Israel. The Doran lectures are, of course, a, a very um, um, 
um, a very uh, important contribution to this uh, 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 to this attempt by uh, providing the means for uh, bringing every year a distinguished uh, visitor in a particular areas of population, resources, development. Uh, and I'm very grateful to, to your father for uh, making this gift. Very, very grateful to you for uh, making it possible. And uh, I'm sure that uh, Professor Easterly, that we are all uh, uh, looking forward to hearing his, uh, his remarks, uh, will be followed by uh, uh, by other visitors that will enrich the academic environment here at, uh, at Hebrew University. So thank you very much for making it possible, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward for the, uh, the next uh, Doran Lectures here at Hebrew University. Thank you. Now, Professor Eitan Shashinsky. Thank you. It's a pleasure indeed and an honor to uh, introduce uh, the first uh, lecturer in the Doran series of lectures. Um, professor William Easterly is a professor at New York University and a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution. He received his uh, PhD from MIT, an institution which some of us know quite well, in 1985, and then was for 16 years at the World Bank uh, in the macroeconomic and economic growth. Uh, department and advisor to the heads of the bank. He was then at the Institute for International Economics and other centers, which I won't elaborate. His best known books are two. One is The Elusive Quest for Growth, Economist Adventures and Misadventures in the Tropics. You can already see where these things are, where, where the wind is blowing. The second book is The White Man's Burden. Of course, this is from Rudyard Kipling's uh, poem. By the way, I look back today at this poem, and in the second uh, lines, in the, in the following lines of, that, of the title, he also talks about the threat of terror. And if you look back at Rudyard Kipling, 1895. Um, so the second book is The White Man's Burden. Why the West's effort to aid the rest have done so much ill and so little good. He co-edited many other books and wrote 60 or so articles. His work has been discussed uh, on any outlet, any media outlet that you know from uh, uh, national public radio, national public television, uh, BBC, and so forth and so on. I'm quite certain that a number of you here have heard him. Uh, uh, speak uh, in those uh, on those forums. Now, the views of Professor Easterly uh, uh, are, I think, the titles already suggest. His best signifying feature is he's quite skeptical about the efficacy of foreign aid, uh, the way it has been uh, uh, pushed and uh, and. Uh, uh, put forward by many, for example, the Millennium Program of the UN, and so forth. He thinks that uh, foreign aid has failed to produce sustainable growth in many cases, perhaps in most cases. Uh, in particular, he was critical about the issue of debt relief. And I think this, his views on that have been shared by others. And so uh, he, for example, uh, thought that the, uh, the widely publicized um, uh, media blitz by uh, uh, Bob Geldof, organized by Bob Geldof and, uh, and uh, Bono, the singer Bono, Live 8, was it called? Live 8, and so forth. He said those kind of things, while commendable in itself, cannot be regarded as a real contribution to the basic important issues at hand. Um, he was attacked by some foremost fellow economist, Jeffrey Sachs, known to many of you here, who uh, uh, thought that uh, Bill Easterly is uh, exaggerating the costs, undermining their success, uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the foreign aid efforts worldwide, in particular in Africa. We're talking about Africa. 
on the feature, on the characteristics of foreign aid, Bill distinguished between two types. He said the planners, on the one hand, and the uh, and the bottom-up uh, searchers, and he uh, subscribes to the latter more than others. And we may have we may hear about that later today. As I said, he was criticized by Jeff Sachs and others, uh, and uh, but he was also lauded by many. For example, Amartya Sen, while didn't accept all his uh, uh, criticisms, thought that many points were very well taken. And I can say that he, in, man, in many ways, he uh, uh, created a new agenda for about foreign aid. I cannot but mention also that Jeff Sachs accused uh, Bill Easterly of coordinating his opinions with the neocons. These are the neoconservatives in Washington. Um, um, if I may say that word here uh, is the Jewish neoconservatives in Washington. Uh, uh, Paul Wolpovich, Irving Kristol, uh, Richard Pearl, and others. Um, well, if you have any trouble there, in this country you have a safe haven here. Uh, don't, uh, 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 you can uh, uh, just, uh, this will be a place where you'll be uh, accepted in open, with open arms. So I will stop here and I'll say clearly we have here a first rate, world class economist, nonconformist, and I'm sure therefore that we are going to hear an exciting lecture the first Duran lecture on free markets, doomsday scenarios, and economic development. Please. Thank you, Aitan, for that extremely kind introduction. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here and a real honor to give the, the first Duran lecture. Uh, I've only been in Israel one previous time. Uh, and that was on a, a somewhat sad occasion. It was uh, a conference to honor the memory of Michael Bruno, who is, was associated with Hebrew University. And Michael Bruno was a very special person to me. He was my, my mentor and sort of a, a father figure in economics for me at the World Bank. And it's very sad that he, he died at an early age and is no longer with us to contribute on these debates. Uh, but now this is a, a much happier occasion. Uh, we're here to talk about uh, very serious issues, about uh, free markets, about doomsday scenarios that have to do with overpopulation, and what they mean for economic development. So let me give you a, a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about for the next four and a half hours. So. Uh, just to lay my cards on the table and to, um, to thank uh, Dr. Doran for, uh, for celebrating intellectual freedom, I'm actually going to argue somewhat the opposite of his position. And it's, it's tremendous uh, intell commitment to intellectual and academic freedom that uh, this lecture s sponsors a whole range of views. So I'm going to argue that uh, free markets have done a, a remarkably good job coping with the doomsday scenario of overpopulation. And they've really done almost a miraculously good job of coping with the, the problem of overpopulation. And, I'm, and I think it's somewhat unfortunate that uh, wor worries about overpopulation and other doomsday scenarios, of course, uh, the one that many of you will be thinking of throughout this lecture will be global warming. And I'm not actually going to directly address at any point in this lecture global warming for the simple reason that I don't know anything at all about it. Uh, and so I stick to the economist principle of a comparative advantage of talking what you know a little bit about. Uh, but I'm going to argue that the, the way that the free market has coped with the, the impending doom of overpopulation is, I think, a very hopeful lesson for how we are going to cope with the impending doom of global warming. But I think we can expect, expect just as much 
creativity and inventiveness on this issue as we have seen with overpopulation. Now, I'm also kind of aware that this is kind of an awkward moment to be celebrating free markets. Here we are in the midst of one of the worst financial cra crashes in my lifetime. I'm probably going to go into uh, a historic global recession, which may have already begun. I, I'm not actually predicting that. I don't, I don't know anything about such things. I'm a development economist. I know more about the economy of Ghana than I do about the economy of the United States, so don't take that as a prediction. Uh, but uh, never, nevertheless, despite these per periodic crises, and recessions, free markets do a remarkably good job in the long run of promoting economic development. So I think it would be a great shame if the fear of doomsday were to be used as an argument against a free market system, because I, I'm going to argue that a free market system is actually the world's best hope for the world's poor, for the world's most desperate people, the poorest people in the world, that their best hope is actually uh, a free market system for the world and the spread of that system. And I hope to demonstrate that to you today. So um, let me talk about some of these doomsday scenarios. They've been around for a long time. Uh, actually, this was written in uh, 1968 by Paul Ehrlich in a book called The Population Bomb, when he predicted that because of overpopulation, and this was the uh, periodic doomsday scenario that that was talked about uh, in the 60s and 70s over the threat of overpopulation, uh, that he predicted specifically that famines would be sweeping through Asia, Africa, and the Middle East and would kill off as much as one-fifth of humanity. It's really nice when someone makes such a specific prediction because then it will be contradicted so absolutely dramatically that we can see that his, well, he was completely wrong. <laughs> uh, then the Club of Rome came along in 1972 with their limits to growth uh, predicting, also predicting doomsday if we did not immediately trash the free market system and turn everything over to uh, global central planners who would keep the economy from growing, keep the population from growing, keep me from having children, and you know, in general, control everything and prevent the impending doom of overpopulation. They predicted if, if we did not do that, that there would be a doomsday, there would be a catastrophe. Well, of course, that didn't happen either. Then this, uh, this theme has continued to be sounded throughout the years, uh, fears of population outrunning the food supply, outrunning the water supply, outrunning finite natural resources, minerals, oil fields, land, everything was in obviously fixed supply and population kept growing. So how can we not eventually have a crisis? So this was sort of the old view that, um, that I ran across when I was in, in high school on this, you know, was was a very hot issue, and then it sort of went away for a while. Uh, but now it has come back. Uh, now the, now the, the doomsday fears about overpopulation and global warming and other kinds of threats of overpopulation have come back. And they've come back in part uh, due to um, my good friend, Jeffrey Sachs. My good friend, Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, is, just, uh, just when everyone was getting very bored of our uh, arguing with each other about the effectiveness of foreign aid and uh, my pointing out how, how wrong he was about everything he said about foreign aid, uh, he came along and wrote a whole new book about overpopulation. Now I get to point out how wrong he is about overpopulation. It's, a, it's very kind of him to provide this opportunity. Uh, I, I have the greatest of respect for Professor Sachs. He's, he's also a an academic professor at a leading uh, prominent university in New York City. Um, the name of it I can't remember at the moment. Um, uh, it's, uh, I think it's a rival to NYU. Um, we, some of the students who don't get into NYU, we send them over there. Um, the, um, so anyway, Professor Sachs uh, has brought back the, the idea of the population bomb. Uh, he says, um, in some locations, uh, societies have outstripped the carrying capacity of the land, resulting in uh, chronic hunger. Hunger is going up, and a large-scale exodus of desperate populations. So he's raising the the scary, scary uh, image of uh, migrating populations flooding the rich countries, including Israel, including the United States, and. Uh, the world's population growth is condemning the poorest nations to ever greater poverty. 
it's, uh, it raises the pressure again for, for mass migration and conflict. Uh, and then he also said, um, although he made this prediction, which did turn out to be correct, that although most products will soon be too costly to purchase, there will be a thriving market for the sale of books on how to fix them. Actually, he didn't really say that. I, uh, <laughs> I got this quote from another, uh, another source on the internet. Uh, but this, this quote, last quote, is correct. This is one, one of the predictions of the overpopulation alarmist that has been proven correct, that uh, the sales of books on how to deal with population will, will be thriving. So uh, what is Professor Sachs's answer to this threat of, of overpopulation? Well, uh, he's calling for international collective action and moving away from the world's uh, free market, moving away from free trade and free markets and from capitalism and so on. Uh, the pressures of scarce energy resources, uh, mass migration, all these things are too scary. We can't just leave things to what he calls naked market forces. Uh, I never, I've never seen a naked market force. I'd like to see one sometime, but uh, I've only seen clothed, naked, uh, clothed market forces, but um, a com a, and he uh, points out that a, a common fate on a crowded planet will require new forms of global cooperation. And he's basically saying uh, that we have to find out uh, new, we have to figure out new ways to uh, uh, do global cooperation or we are doomed to this, uh, this doomsday of overpopulation with these, uh, these scenarios. So, um, I do want to say his, his analysis has been endorsed by many leading economists, including this one. Uh, this is uh, Mr. Bono, who is, uh, whose economic analysis in recent years has really been taken the profession by storm. Uh, you might consider him for the second Doran lecture. Uh, um, but I, I'm sorry, that's kind of a cheap shot. I'm, I, I use Bono to make fun of Professor Sachs. Uh, there's other serious economists who I respect much more. Angelina Jolie. Uh, um, uh, Angelina Jolie actually has a very concrete solution to overpopulation. It's just that she will go around uh, adopting all these surplus babies in all the poor nations of the world. Um, it's gotten so bad that wherever she goes, the mothers start hiding their children because they. So <laughs> now, um, now. To be fair, there, is, there are very respectable economic theories behind these doomsday scenarios. Uh, there, you know, there is a, a real hard logic behind all this. We have stuff that's in fixed supply. We have land that's not going, we're not going to get any more land on Earth. We have all the land on Earth that we're ever going to have. We have a finite amount of oil, a finite amount of copper, a finite amount of uh, water circulating through the world's ecosystem. So it makes sense that as the world's population and the world's GDP grows, that these things will become scarcer, their prices will increase, uh, we'll have to somehow uh, accept a much diminished standard of living as these things get scarcer. All of these seem like sensible economic pr predictions. Uh, and then, of course, there's another sense in which the skepticism about free markets is totally justified, and that is that free markets do not handle certain problems very well. And, and namely, any problem where the, the social cost of an activity is not equal to the private cost. So if a, a firm is producing something and generating pollution, then the pollution is creating a social cost, and the firm doesn't pay any penalty for that in, under most uh, uh, environmentally uh, ab, uh, uh, ignorant uh, governments. And so uh, you know, the private cost to the firm is is nothing, but, but the cost of the pollution is very high. And conceivably, the same could be true of, of population, that uh, each of us makes our private decision about having children, but we don't take into, the, into consideration what we, the effect that our children and their children's children will have on, the, on the, the finite resources. We have a sort of tragedy of the commons problem, that more people are consuming the same amount of finite resources, and the market just cannot handle that very well. Uh, so that's, that's, there are very respectable economic theories that say that there is a problem about growing population with finite resources, and there is a reason why the free market cannot handle this, because private cost is not equal to social cost. 
However, it's going to turn out that despite these theoretical predictions, the market has done uh, surprisingly well in handling the problem of overpopulation. Uh, let's, let's consider some of the specific predictions that these theories make and that the doomsday scenarios make about uh, overpopulation, that it will lead to growing hunger because we uh, have only a certain amount of land to grow food. It will lead to increasing scarcity of any finite resource, such as oil or copper or any other mineral. It will lead to increasing scarcity of water, which is in scarce, uh, fixed supply. Uh, and then, as you saw from many of the quotes I gave you, it will lead to my increased migration from those regions that are stressed under great population stress to the less stressed regions. And usually what people have in mind is people coming from sub-Saharan Africa and possibly North Africa to Europe and North America. That's usually kind of the, the classic migration that people are, are have in mind when they talk about the pressure of, of population causing migration. And lastly, the prediction, the biggest prediction of all, that growing overpopulation will lead to growing world poverty. So uh, I do have to note these predictions have already been tested by a previous generation and sort of contradicted. Uh, but you know, so uh, I wouldn't have anything to do if uh, you know if this matter, matter had been settled there. But fortunately, uh, my good friend and other uh, population activists. Uh, like Professor Sachs, have, have re revived the issue, have revived the old alarms, the old doomsday scenarios. And so now we have the pleasure of once again testing these same predictions and seeing if they hold true. And, and here's where I slip in my little uh, uh, kind of dodgy move uh, that uh, I'm hoping to inspire you by saying that the market has, has handled most of these problems by saying that the creativity and entrepreneurship that is unleashed by the free market is likely to be able to handle uh, global warming as well. But that's about as close as I'm going to get to address global warming directly. So uh, our first prediction is that growing overpopulation will lead to less land per capita, less food per capita, and growing hunger. So let's test this, OK? We have, we have hard data. We can test this. So uh, well, the first prediction is right. There's less land per capita. So this is, uh, in the world as a whole, the average amount of arable land per capita. And it's gone down from 1961 to 2006. It's almost been cut in half from one hectare per person to half a, a hectare per person. So that's true. The land uh, per capita has gone down. So uh, it would naturally follow that uh, food production would have gone down, right? Food production per capita. Food production per capita. So of course I'll show you a graph of food going down like this. This is uh, my, the blue line shows you how food production has dra dramatically decreased thanks to the uh, in increasing scarcity of land. Uh, no, the graph is not upside down. Uh, actually, food production per capita has actually gone up. Food production per capita, despite overpopulation, has gone up steadily at a steady rate throughout these decades. Uh, so the first prediction was wrong. What about, what about hunger going up? Uh, well, the red line here is the percent of the world's population who are undernourished. Now this is, uh, you know, all of these figures are, are somewhat shaky and are based on somewhat sketchy data, but they're the best we have for, for data. So this is the percent share of the world's population that is undernourished. It's gone from 30, around 30% 30 in 1971 all the way down to about 15% in 2005. So actually, world hunger is not getting worse. It's getting better. The, the percent of uh, people in hunger has been cut in half in, in this generation, in my generation. I'm not taking personal responsibility for that, but in my generation, the, world, the world's hunger problem has been cut in half. And the blue line, just to remind you of what's going on in the background, is just the logarithm of population. Its population, of course, has continued to to mount uh, very steeply, and yet hunger did not increase, it decreased. And of course, if, if uh, food was becoming scarcer, then its price would go up, right? Uh, so you know that's one thing that we teach you in economics classes. If something is becoming scarcer and scarcer supply relative to demand, then its price will be driven up. Well, here's a, a graph of four price indices for various foods for the four main grains of the world. 
uh, maize, rice, soybeans, and wheat. Uh, I guess soybeans is not technically a grain, but I'm not a farmer, so what do I know? Uh, the, so actually, food, food prices have not gone up over time. There has not been increasing scarcity of food. If anything, food prices have been trending downward, and the recent blip upward in food prices due, due to uh, reliance on biofuels is not much of a blip compared to the long-run trend. Uh, what about the prediction that uh, growing overpopulation would lead to scarcity of minerals? Uh, well, that again, one, the easiest way to test that is just look at mineral prices. Uh, if, if minerals are becoming increasingly scarce because uh, population is demanding more and more uh, copper and oil and all these things, then the prices should be driven up. So let's just look at the prices again. Uh, the, the blue line is the index of world population. So I just want to keep reminding you, for those who don't know it, that yes, indeed, it is true that the world population is growing dramatically. Oh, actually, this is, uh, I'm sorry, this is world GDP. So world GDP has actually from, uh, from 1949 to the present has increased by a factor of nine. The world's total GDP, the total income of the world, has increased nine times since 1949. And so, of course, that has dramatically driven up mineral prices, like those that are shown here. Well, no, it hasn't. Actually, mineral prices have, have stayed flat. They've fluctuated up and down, but they've stayed flat. There's no upward trend in the price of aluminum, coal, iron, uh, copper. Well, then you think, well, what about oil? It must, it must be the case of oil. Well, uh, oil does fluctuate a lot, dramatically, uh, but it doesn't really seem to have much to do with population. It just has to do with the OPEC cartel and, uh, and various wars and other shocks to the world's oil, oil markets. But there's no obvious long-run trend in oil either. It go goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. You know, these are the kind of things that make economists such bad, we're so bad at prediction. You know, the only, whenever anyone asks me at a cocktail party to predict something like the price of oil or interest rates, uh, I just say, well, I'm, you know, from my, based on my research, I think they will fluctuate. Uh, okay, what about uh, water scarcity? Well, this one is a little more difficult to get at. I'm only going to show you a kind of very indirect indicator of water scarcity. Uh, I'm going to show you some good news on water, but that it's not directly, it's not only affected by water scarcity. So. The good news on water is that the percent of the world's population that have access to clean water has actually increased sharply over, once again, over the last few decades. Here we have data since 1970. Again, I'm reminding you in the blue line that the world's population is going up sharply. And the red line shows you the global average, uh, the, the, on average, what percent of the world's population have access do not, I'm sorry, do not have access, what percent of the world's population do not have access to clean water? So uh, that was a very alarming number back in 1970. It was almost 60 percent of the world's population did not have access to clean water to this, you know, that, I, that we all take for granted in rich countries. Just drinking to demonstrate. Um, and what, ha what happened over the succeeding uh, decades? Well, that percentage uh, without access to clean water has steadily declined. Now, of course, this also has a lot to do with, in with improved infrastructure, water supply systems, and so on. Uh, but it's certainly, uh, as far as people actually ha having access to drinking water, there is no crisis apparent in any numbers like these. This is, this is not the perfect measure, but there is good news on water. The percent of people who don't have access to water has dramatically decreased. It's, a, it's now a third of what it used to be. It's now only 20% of the world's population that does not have access to clean water. Uh, okay, and then the, the migration prediction is that the, there would be these in, you know, population refugees, that all these uh, places that were having very rapid population growth, like Africa, where people have very large families, that you know, all these surplus people would migrate to the rich regions. Uh, well, is that is that what's happening? Uh, well, here's the actual data on the stock of migrants 
uh, from each region of the world that live outside their home region. So Sub-Saharan Africa has 1% of its population living outside its home region. So that's not much of a uh, mass migration compared to other, other regions. Actually, the, uh, the region that people really seem to be fleeing from is Australia and New Zealand. That's a, people are fleeing there in waves. They're four times, four times more likely to emigrate from Australia or New Zealand as you are from Africa. Now, of course, I'm, uh, you know, as an economist, you always have to say on the one hand, on the other hand, of course, there are other factors at play here, like maybe the, the migration, immigration controls may be much stricter on Africans than they are on Australians and New Zealanders. That's, you know, there's all kinds of other factors. But just on the raw data, we don't really see this mass migration from the stressed region happening compared to other regions. Actually, Europe is also a place that people are free, fleeing from to uh, uh, the rest of Sub-Saharan Europe, yes. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm not sure what I agreed to, but I agreed to something there. Uh, so, uh, and you know, actually, North America, we have as much of our population as an American. I have as much uh, of my population living abroad as Africans do. One percent of the population. So, you know, people are also fleeing population-stressed America. I, maybe it's my fault. I have three kids. I, I made it more crowded, but. Uh, so. Why, why did the, all these doomsday predictions fail? All these sensible theories and, you know, smart people who predicted doomsday, why did the predictions fail? Well, uh, there, there are two dynamic things about free markets that makes it possible to cope with the pressure of population on finite resources. Two very dynamic things happen. Uh, the first is that when a resource is starting to become scarce, or people anticipate that it's going to become scarce, then these brilliant technological entrepreneurs invent ways to get more output out of the same input. And that actually is, I'm going to show you in a little bit, is really the driving force behind most, economic, behind most growth of living, living standards, most growth of per capita income is technology, technological innovation technological entrepreneurs find ways to make more out of less. That's one of the, and one of the genius uh, features of the free market system is that it permits a totally decentralized search for technological breakthroughs. Any technological breakthrough that will benefit humanity in the sense that it's, this is something that is actually responding to market signals because as the, a resource is becoming scarce or it, it's anticipated to become scarce, its futures price will rise. People will see a profit opportunity if they can come up with some new technology that they can sell that will economize on the use of this resource. And so there's tremendous incentives for technological entrepreneurs to find ways to make more out of less. And that is, in fact, what they have achieved. So all those successes of rising food production, of uh, flat mineral prices despite rising population, all of these are the fruits of technological innovation that takes place in the genius of the decentralized free market entrepreneurship system. And the second thing, the second great force that happens under free market, and the thing that many of these uh, doomsday scenarios forget, is that we have freedom of choice. We can substitute. If something is becoming scarce, we can substitute it with something else. When copper was starting to become scarce, uh, you know, people started to stumble on things like optical fiber that substitutes for copper wire. So this, uh, this ability to substitute for something else besides the thing that's becoming scarce is the second great force uh, a free market economy unleashes to deal with overpopulation and pressure on finite resources. If, you, if the possibilities for substitution are sufficiently great, then you, can, you just keep substituting away from the thing that is becoming scarcer and scarcer and replace it with other, other inputs. And again, only a totally decentralized free market system in which every firm and entrepreneur is acting in their own interest has sort of the, the genius and the knowledge to do this 
because only they have enough knowledge of their particular situation to seize a particular profit opportunity that is realized when they substitute a resource that's in abundant supply for a resource that's in scarce supply. Only the, the genius of the market can figure that out. So now I want to show you. So that's, that's basically why the doomsday scenarios did not come true and why I'm going to stand here and say today that they will not come true in the future either. There are many things we have to worry about in today's world. Uh, there are many crises that we're facing in today's world. Uh, there are many things that worry us about the future. There's, uh, there's war, there's terrorism, there's Britney Spears. Um, but one of the things that I think the historical record has demonstrated we don't, we don't need to worry about is overpopulation. And so let me just insert a little bit of evidence that technology is, is really this uh, wonderful force that actually does account for most uh, economic wealth that we see in the world today. First, in, in the short to medium run, there's a standard result in uh, people who, do, who study growth, that almost all growth of living standards is due to imp increasing efficiency in the use of inputs. That that process that I mentioned earlier of getting more output out of the same amount of input, that process accounts for almost all of the increase in our living standards. And very little is accounted for by increases in machinery or other factors or in, in increased utilization of resource, finite resources. So technology is the thing that has, has always been driving living standards. In the long run, it, I'm going to show you an interesting graph that is not directly related to this, uh, to this talk, but I wanted to insert it anyway because it's a fun graph. It's one of my favorite graphs. Uh, just to make the point that technology really does matter an awful lot in human history for, how, for, the, for producing wealth. And this is the fact that uh, I've discovered. This is the fact that I've discovered with a couple of uh, co-authors who did most of the work. I just, you know, assigned my name to the paper. But uh, the, we've, we found out that there's a very high correlation between the level of technology in 1500 AD and the level of uh, GDP today in today's countries. So we were able to construct a measure of technology adoption using lots of different technologies like use of the wheel and language, written, written language and so on. And measures of technological sophistication in 1500 do a very good job predicting who has the biggest GDP today. So in the very, very long run, technology is really the big story behind the wealth of nations. Technology is, is the story that if you, had, if you were advanced technologically in 1500, now I guess Israel would be one of the outliers because uh, you, you, you became wealthy without being uh, uh, well along in 1500, but you know, I, in economics we don't expect everyone to fit all, all of our predictions. So it just you just, just have to fit on average. You're allowed to be an exception. So t the level of technology in 1500 predicts how rich nations are today. Predicts their GDP, total GDP today. So why 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 what else is going on that makes uh, populate overpopulation turn out not to have been as scary as as we as we thought it was and some people still think it is. Well, there are some. I want to give you some other economic theories that actually predict. And this, so this is really going to fulfill Aitan's wish that I try to be as provocative as possible, for the prediction that uh, higher population is actually has a positive effect on people's living standards. On people, it actually has a positive effect on the world's ability to grow faster. And wh why, why could this possibly be true? Well, this is uh, something that uh, a theory it, that in economics is known as the Einstein principle in honor of Albert Einstein, who I, I just found out from a short tour outside as one of was on, on the first board of Hebrew University. So uh, it's a very, very happy coincidence that I put this in. Uh, so the Einstein principle is very simple. It's the idea that the larger the population, the greater the probability that one of them will be an Einstein. Okay? If you want an Einstein, if you want to produce more Einsteins, the best you're, you just have to keep rolling the dice over and over and over again by having more and more children. 
Just produce as many children as possible and hope that one of them will be an Einstein. Of course, the more rolls of the dice you have, the more likely it is that you will get a very high roll of the dice and you will get another Einstein. So that's one of the, that's one of the benefits of having a large population. And then, but isn't that offset by the fact that you had to get, that you had so many people to feed that before you found the Einstein, that you created so many additional people who, who have to eat before you found the Einstein? Well, there, there's the other great thing about the theory of the Einstein principle is that the ideas of the Einstein can be shared with one other person, two other people, two million other people, two billion other people. The idea, ideas can be shared at zero cost with an infinitely large number of people, however large the number of people is. So that means the ideas are available to everyone who has been who has created along the way in our search for the next Einstein, and the, the brilliant ideas of the Einstein create the technology that make it possible to feed all of those people that came along while we were searching for the next Einstein. And so this is one of the theories that economists have come up with to explain the fact that in fact, larger population in world history has usually turned out to be a good thing for people's living standards. Far from creating poverty, it has actually created prosperity. This has been the, 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 what the research of, of some economists has shown. Uh, and then one other, one other principle that could be also at work is that there are, are many economic activities where you have sort of a fixed cost that you have to pay up front and then you have uh, returns to scale, and that you, once you pay the fixed cost, then you can produce something, like say once you build a factory, then you can produce each unit in the factory at a very low additional cost. Each, each additional unit has a very low cost. So there's what we call increasing returns to scale. If that's true, then also having a larger population is good, because you will benefit more from the increasing returns to scale. More technologies will become feasible, because you'll be able to get more and more technologies that have these very high fixed costs that are only justified if you have a sufficiently large population to spread the fixed cost among many populations. So both of these principles seem to have worked out very well in human history. So what actually happened in human history? This is, uh, this is not my idea. This is based on the research of some other economists, uh, Michael Kramer, Oded Galore, and David Weil. But they pointed out that uh, the historical evidence is actually that population growth, per capita growth, and standards of living have all increased over time as world population has increased. And I'll show you that. Here's first of all the, this is the, the, the scale of world population and world's average world standard of living going all the way back to 1,000. You know, I, I, I don't know if you intended for this lecture series to cover, uh, you know, uh, 500 or even 1,000 years of history, but I'm trying to give you your money's worth, you know, on a, on a per year basis. This is a very inexpensive lecture series. Uh, uh, so going all the way back to the year 1000, since the year 1000 population, which is the blue line, this is a, uh, this is a base two uh, graph, which means that every time you move up one notch, you double you double the whatever the relevant quantity is. So every time you do move up one notch, you double population. So population double, then quadrupled, then octupled, then 16 tupled. I don't know that word exactly. And then 32 tupled. Uh, population is now 32 times larger than it was in the year 1000. What was the effect of this population explosion, this population bomb that Paul Ehrlich and Jeffrey Sachs were so worried about? Well, what went with it was dramatic increase in living standards. Actually, the population explosion came first, and then the expansion of living standards came later. So, so far, it seems like population may not only not be scary, it may actually bring pos positive benefits across in, in some historical time periods. And then here's, here's uh, more evidence. This is uh, showing you the relationship between the initial world population going back to the year 1000, and then the population growth in the next 50 years. So when population was very small, population growth rates were very, lo were, were, were very low. Then as population dramatically increased, which is on the, now on the horizontal axis, the growth rate of population far from collapsing actually accelerated. As population increased, it made it possible to sustain a faster growth of population. This is a really re remarkable confirmation of this idea that population could actually be 
beneficial in some ways, that as population grows, you can sustain a faster increase of population as the scale of initial population grows. And this, the same is true with per capita growth, the, the growth per year of living standards. This growth, per capita growth over a 50-year period is shown on the vertical axis, and the initial population going back to the year 1000 of all the 50-year periods is shown on the horizontal axis. As the scale of population increases, uh, growth actually accelerates. So in the theories of uh, Galore and Weil, uh, this is actually, po rising population is actually one of the triggers of the Industrial Revolution. It's because of rising population that we had the Industrial Revolution and, and have had many other technological revolutions since then. So you wanted me to make the most contrarian case possible, and here, here it is, that not only is population overpopulation not a problem, and you, so far in human history it's been a blessing. The higher population has led to uh, accelerating growth of both population itself and of living standards, and thus created the Industrial Revolution and all the other technological revolutions and higher living standards. So now let's, let's step a, Say, say that I haven't convinced you that you, that despite this evidence, you still are worried about overpopulation. So let's think of the, the two ways that we could deal with any big global problem like overpopulation. That, that's the other big contrast in this lecture. There's, you know, differing views of whether population is in fact a disaster, and I've tried to argue that in fact the uh, the evolution of capitalism has coped with overpopulation extremely well and maybe even made it a blessing. Uh, but suppose that there, that it was a problem. What, what would be the best way to deal with it? So, well, the two alternatives on the table are sort of free markets, which I'm trying to advocate today, and then the alternative that my friend uh, Jeff Sachs is advocating is some, some kind of inter international collective action. So. Let me give you the evidence for free markets. The more free market you are, the richer you are. This is a, a standard result known in, in economics. The more institutions are supportive of free markets, the, more, the richer the country is. Uh, this is a direct measure of how free market you are on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis is how rich you are. So those economies that are not very, have not developed free markets very much, mainly in, the, in uh, Africa, uh, are still very poor, and those economies that have well-developed, highly specialized, complex free market institutions have succeeded in, in attaining uh, great wealth. And then we have the evidence over time that, and this is now the, the response to the idea that overpopulation would lead to increasing world poverty. Well, why didn't that happen? Well, it's because uh, actually the world has been moving more and more towards free markets over time. This is a a measure of uh, the composition of the world's nations between uh, nations that have relatively free markets, partly free markets, and not free markets. This is according to uh, an index that was developed by an institute in Canada. There are many different indices that tend to be highly associated with each other, tend to show the same thing. So it, the, the overall picture is the world is becoming more and more capitalist, more and more free market over time. And what is that associated with? Well, it's associated with the fall in world poverty. This is uh, from a, a paper by Xavier Sali Martin. This actually shows that world poverty is decreasing steadily, thanks to the, the spread of free markets. World poverty rates, these are poverty rates at different poverty lines. So the highest one is a poverty line of $3 a day, uh, which is what the World Bank used to give me when I went on international trips. Uh, the, uh, that, was, that was after I got into trouble at the World Bank. Uh, uh, the, then the, the next one is $2 a day and $1 a day and so on. So at, if, at whatever poverty line you consider, uh, world poverty has been decreasing over the past, uh, over the past 30, 35 years. So now let's consider the alternative of collective action. Well, how, how enthusiastic has the world been so far about uh, doing international collective action versus uh, the incentive to produce for free markets? I mean, we can just ask practically, you know, if, if something was really effective and successful, then you would think the world would invest a lot in it. And if something was not, then uh, 
people would not spend much money on it. Well, uh, the free market economy has produced a world GDP of 60 trillion. And then what's, what's going on with international collective action? Well, we have that premier highly lean and mean efficient organization called the United Nations that has a budget of all of 2.5 billion. So this is approximately the, the, the free market people are approximately 35,000 times more enthusiastic about than uh, the United Nations so far as measured by how much money they're willing to, to spend on, in each, in each uh, vehicle. So just how much good is, uh, oops, sorry, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Columbia University. Uh, <laughs> um, I take back everything I said. <laughs> so, you know, just how much good do you expect uh, to come out of 2.5 billion versus the the fantastic flows of $60 billion worth of wealth, $60 trillion worth of wealth that has been created by the free market. Obviously, a lot more good is going to come out of this much wealth that has been created this, here. And this, actually, we don't even know how much wealth is going to come out of this, because this is just the cost of operating the United Nations. We don't know anything about the benefits of the United Well, we actually do know something about the benefits, and they're not probably not as high as the cost. Uh, and, you know, more generally, let's get serious about international collective action. You know, just how effective is the United Nations? Well, um, uh, recently it's been engaged in an exercise called the Millennium Development Goals that a aims to set targets for international collective action to achieve, you know, certain uh, good, really good things by the year 2015. Uh, that was agreed at a, a, U a UN World Summit in the year 2000. That seemed like a really good thing, really positive thing, except for the fact that the UN had already promised that in previous summits. In fact, a, a previous World Summit in 1977 had already set the goals for uni universal access to water and sanitation, and those have now been uh, those were not met. Those were supposed to be met by 1990. Uh, well, international collective action didn't do so well on that occasion. Those targets had to be postponed to the year 2015 now for the new Millennium Development Goals. Uh, a UN summit in 1990 set universal primary enrollment as a goal to be attained by international collective action by the year 2000. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. that. That in the year 2000, we had another summit to produce a new goal for universal primary education by the year 2015. As one of my uh, uh, favorite colleagues in development economics wrote a paper about, he said, um, said roughly once every two decades since the Second World War. An international gathering of policymakers has solemnly promised to achieve universal primary education in developing countries by about 20 years thereafter. And then, you know, that didn't work, and then you repeat the exercise. Uh, and actually, unfortunately, uh, the effort to make things happen by international collective action is not working this time either. We already know that many of the in fact, the United Nations itself writes gloomy documents every year saying we're going to miss the Millennium Development Goals by, by a long shot. Uh, we're going to miss them very badly. Um, now, this is not the same thing as like a report to your shareholders saying, you know, sorry, we had, we had a lot of losses this year when you were expecting profits, uh, because the UN never takes responsibility for any of these promises. They just said, you know, these were promised, but nobody's, nobody's held accountable for these missed promises. No, there's no, no one faces any consequence for these promises not being kept. That's why the, this is the essence of why international collective action is so ineffective, that it costs nothing to make a grand promise at a world summit. But unfortunately, this promise does not actually hold anyone accountable for achieving anything or making any constructive progress, making any constructive effort toward achieving that, that grand, grand goal. This is one of the the tragedies of foreign aid that uh, that Professor Sachs and I argued about in the in the last debate. So um, so which do you, which do you think is done better? Uh, free markets have produced the greatest mass escape from poverty in human history, versus uh, international collective action has produced world summits, 
that promised to keep the promises that were unmet since the previous world summits. Uh, how many would vote for the first? So our record on international collective action is, you know, it's it's uh, very idealistic. It's it's hard to crush the dreams of those who place faith in the United Nations. Uh, but you know, we are pragmatists that want to actually see results happen. And the, the thing that has generated most of the results so far has not been international collective action like the United Nations. It's been the free market. So I'm now winding to a close. Now let's let's think about you know other other possible cataclysms. I'm going to tell you the story of another cataclysm that happened: the the New York, the Great New York City horse manure crisis. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this this epic epic doomsday scenario that happened in New York City. There's a tremendous problem with horse manure, and that, that came about, of course, in the late 1800s because there. New York City was flooded with a great population of horse-drawn vehicles, and there, the number of horse-drawn vehicles was increasing, just like population, more and more every year, more and more, more horse-drawn vehicles. And there were, you know, there were professors at Columbia University who were saying, you know, New York City faces a tremendous horse manure crisis because the population of horse-drawn vehicles keeps increasing exponentially. We need to, you know, have an international collective action to deal with the horse manure crisis facing our, city, our greatest cities. Well, of course, it never, this great horse manure crisis never happened uh, because exactly those forces that we talked about earlier, uh, a technology and substitution came to the rescue. Uh, Horse-drawn vehicles were replaced by automobiles, which are producing their own problems until they're replaced by the thing that is going to solve their problems. Uh, but so we avoided the great horse manure crisis of New York City. We've avoided the great overpopulation cataclysms, uh, as I've shown you in this lecture. So um, I think that the lessons for, for today's impending doomsdays is that these forces of technological innovation and substitution under free markets and the Einstein principle and the, the uh, possibility of increasing returns to scales, all of these are mighty forces that make these uh, cataclysms uh, turn out, not, fortunately for us, happily for us, not, not to happen. So we are lucky enough to have a, a sufficiently creative and dynamic system that we can cope with these impending uh, global cataclysms, and they don't, in fact, happen through the genius of, of the system that we've created. So now, of course, I, I do want to make a couple of concessions that, yes, there is some case for government action. I'm not saying that everything should be left to the free market. Yes, there's a lot of things that governments can do. Um, obviously, uh, the environment is a problem that does require some kinds of uh, government intervention in forms of control, administrative controls, which don't work so well, or taxes and subsidies, which would work better because they would unleash the market, but just use uh, taxes to try to equate private costs and social costs. That is obviously a case for that uh, in environmental economics. And there's obviously a case for that with uh, the global warming problem, that you have some kind of tax that, that deals with the, the excessive carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, and there have been some modest successes already with this kind of government policy intervention, which have kept uh, pollution, environmental pollution, uh, in an improved state compared to what it would have been without government intervention. Uh, so far, the domestic governments are doing much better than any international body at making these interventions. So, you know, and that's no surprise because domestic governments are democratically accountable to their own citizens, so they tend to pro solve the problems of their own citizens. International bodies like the United Nations are not accountable to anyone. There's no democratic accountability for the United Nations, so they, they're much less effective at solving these. Uh, at, achieving these interventions that solve, solve environmental and other problems. Uh, but, e you know, we forget that even the success of government action relies on technologies and goods that were invented by the free market. That even if the government has to intervene and put on taxes and subsidies, the, the forces that get unleashed are free market forces that find technologies that, that reduce pollution, that, re that reduce global warming. These are the things that get unleashed from the private sector. So ultimately, the answer is still the private sector. It's just the government needs to guide 
the private free free market in a way that will unleash the power of technology the power of substitution the power of einst a future einstein's to figure out these problems so should we fear doomsday uh, I, I think I have a pretty happy, happy message to give, give to you today, that we don't, we, we don't really have uh, these kind of doomsdays to fear, that uh, free markets have adapted continuously throughout human history through technology and substitution to avert many, many different predictions of doomsday induced by growing population. And at this point, it would really be a, a tragedy if the people who are talking about doomsday scenarios persuaded the rest of us to abandon free markets when free markets have been the greatest source of creativity and human problem solving in history. And at a time when freedom is needed more than ever for the, for the people that, that uh, beyond my own family and nation, the people I most care about are the, are the world's poorest, most desperate, desperate people. Uh, what they need more than anything else is the unleashed power of free markets to lift up people out of poverty, to achieve those reductions in poverty, or continue to reduce those poverty rates that I showed you in, the, in the, that prior graph. That is the hope of the world's poorest people. And it would be very tragic if that hope was snatched away out of a misguided and misplaced fear of a future doomsday that history says just has no historical evidence to support it, that there will be such a doomsday that calls for such a drastic measure as abandoning the free markets that are the main hope of the world's poor. So since this has been a pretty hopeful lecture and, the, the, uh, and since the, uh, the charismatic uh, people on the other side of the debate always have very inspirational rhetoric. Much, much they do always do much better than guys like me from who are from Midwestern America, uh, you know, Ohio. We're not real charismatic people. So I, I decided to quote to close with an inspirational quote from the greatest, one of the greatest of all American orators. That instead of fear, we can have a dream. When we let freedom ring when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we'll be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Easterly. Uh, I promise you next year uh, we'll probably have a very different tone, very different perspective. But I think this is a great beginning to a lecture series. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, the Doran family. Thank you, President Megiddo. And thank you. Okay.